I've spent the last 19, almost 20 years um, working on the Tomapan Indian Reservation in southern Arizona um, with a, a community-based uh, NGO there called Tomapan Community Action. And kind of some of those, those images are just from kind of a little glimpse into the community um, and also a voice of the community that was um, uh, Danny Lopez, the, the late Danny Lopez, who was an elder we worked with for, for many years. And it was a song um, about Itoy, Itoy's elder brother, looking out over the desert and seeing the people and being happy. And um, as I'm going to talk a lot about on Thursday, things like stories and songs are really critical to the kind of ways of understanding and the, the epistemologies of, of indigenous peoples and in general in the Tongue in specific. Um, I thought it was important to start with this because today I'm not going to actually talk very much in detail about the community, but I'm going to talk a lot about why talking about community and engaging with community is important. So I'm going to be dealing a little bit theoretically today, and I'm, I'm hoping with this, and I'm going to end with some video, hopefully it'll prompt people to want to learn more about the details. But today, really, I want to situate what's happening in terms of indigenous conceptions of food sovereignty and also kind of more grassroots perspectives globally are really how they're responding to and I think challenging conceptions of food sovereignty um, as they are today. I'm going to take a step back before going too far. Um, I don't know that everyone's really familiar or kind of has, has engaged with this concept of food sovereignty. Um, so I, I, pardon me if this is something that, that a lot of you know, but I think it's really important to understand where the food sovereignty um, project and conversation is today. And I've chosen this as kind of the most basic, very basic understanding of food sovereignty. I think as it's generally accepted. Um, and this is something from La Via Campesina, which is a transnational um, organization uh, that has had and emerged from the grassroots level of food sovereignty work um, across the globe. And so I think it's very important. And, you know, I don't like the kind of standing and reading things, but I think that it's really important to start here. And particularly this concept that food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. And I want to point out a couple of themes, even in just this very small statement that I'm going to return to. First of all, this concept of it being a right. Uh, food sovereignty is, a, is very often considered a rights-based discourse. Um, secondly, health and culture. I'm going to be returning to those. Um, ecology and sustainable methods. And I particularly find this last point critical because it's where the, the really powerful democratic, what, what some writers have called the maximal democracy vision of food sovereignty is, which is the rights of people and communities to really define their food and agriculture systems. So this is kind of the framing that, that food sovereignty has had. And you know, it's a very complex and contested area. And I'm going to hopefully make it a somewhat more complex and more contested um, throughout today. So really, what is food sovereignty then? And there are many conceptions out there of, of what it is. Um, a first one is food sovereignty as a rights-based discourse. Right? It's the rights of people to certain types of foods as well as to, how, to determine how those food systems are, are being um, operated, organized, what they're producing, how they're producing it. So as a rights-based discourse is certainly one of the conceptions. The second is really as kind of an oppositional stance to the neoliberal global food system as it exists and is expanding today. And um, that's often kind of referred to almost as this world historic agenda of, of how do we shift the global food system to, to away from that neoliberal uh, food, food system to one that is more localized. And so it's kind of often conceived of as, as this, what Bernstein calls a world historical agenda. So that's another possibility. Another, a third way in which food sovereignty really is operating is as a policy agenda. Um, whether that be at the national level, you have uh, countries like Bolivia that are adopting food sovereignty um, in their constitutions and in their laws as 
um, part of, of their uh, work around dealing with uh, local, well, national food economies to work at the, NG at the um, WTO levels, you know, a lot of levels. So there's, there's certainly a policy agenda that's involved. Um, so it's both in many ways operating as a concept, um, this discourse, uh, this policy agenda, but it's also operating as, as a transnational movement. Um, and you see that primarily, although certainly not exclusively, through Via Campesina and um, other efforts to really network globally to, to define this agenda, move policy change forward, uh, assert rights within communities. However, what I'm going to talk about today is what I think is missing in, in some of these conceptions. And these are not comprehensive, but they're certainly some of the larger ones there. And that's asking the question, what is food sovereignty really look like in communities and um, the, in those communities out of which the concept really emerged. Um, I think that that's largely missing from both the, this kind of uh, world historical mm -hmm. model as well as um, from the academic discourse. And with my work in one particular community, um, I'm going to hopefully start to hold out some possibilities of, of ways to, to move forward. It seems in the conversation about food sovereignty often, it's almost like the Big Bang Theory or understanding the creation of the universe, right? We hear from physicists all the time, one billionth of a second after the Big Bang, and then they go on to describe what happened. And I've always, as a very non-scientific person, wondered, wait, 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 what about that one billionth of a second before the Big Bang? What, what was there? You know, to me, that's the, the really interesting question. And in many ways, the, the literature has really had, uh, on food sovereignty has really almost had a Big Bang theory. You see, and this is just one quote, but that food sovereignty is almost always described as having emerged out of the Campesina and these transnational efforts to, to bring kind of the peasant voice, however you want to define it, to the fore. Um, but like with the creation of the universe, I think one of the really interesting questions to ask is, what happened before Via Campesina? What happened before this transnational movement? Um, what was going on that led to its creation? And I think it's really important to understand that food sovereignty as a concept, food sovereignty as a, as a movement, food sovereignty um, as this kind of world historic agenda, what, however you're going to define it, really has emerged out of decades of theoretically informed action within hundreds and thousands of communities to create just and sustainable livelihoods, just and sustainable food systems at the local and, and regional uh, and community levels. That, in essence, the emergence of food sovereignty as a movement and as a discourse and as a concept really reflected <coughs> the existence of these thousands of projects with millions of people acting on the grassroots level. It didn't create the practice. It emerged from the practice. And you know, you can, however you want to define it, it can go back, you could say thousands of years. Certainly you can look into influential moments in the 20th century, whether you're talking about you know, Gandhi's salt march or some of the liberation struggles for independence in Africa, liberation theology and those movements for a radical democratization in um, Latin America, that I think that's something that hasn't really been explored. What was that pre-Big Bang moment? What were those influences of food sovereignty? So I think that it's really important to begin to, to look at those. So what I'm going to propose, and right now there are rigid lines up there, um, but you're going to see in a minute that they're not rigid, that really they're kind of three groups that are really acting within this kind of broader, what I'm calling the food sovereignty project. Um, and I think that those three groups are practitioners. And by that, I'm talking about the people who are working in communities to do, um, to address local needs, create local projects, um, work on developing local food systems and, and 
the processes of democratizing those food systems. Then there are advocates. And, and by that group, I'm kind of referring to kind of the people involved in these transnational movements, those who are advocating for policy positions, who are asserting food sovereignty as an alternate model to the neoliberalist uh, visions of global food um, kind of hegemony, however you want to phrase it. Um, but they're really engaged in those kind of regional and, and kind of multi national and global conversations about basically asserting those rights um, that we talked about. And then the third group is some of us in this, this room, which is academics, um, people who are largely writing about, thinking about, theorizing food sovereignty as, as a concept. And I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but basically I think each of those groups is taking a very different primary approach, and they're not exclusive, their primary approach is to things like the realm in which they act. I'm, I'm suggesting that practitioners tend to work on the local and regional level, whereas advocates are working in these national and international networks, and academics are working primarily through um, kind of academic institutional networks. There's different kinds of outcomes that are sought by a lot of their work. There's different methodologies, I think, that are being used by these three groups with different audiences different visions of change, of social change, and different frameworks for understanding things. So I, I think that to look at these three groups is, can be very fruitful in understanding where we need to go with, with food sovereignty in general. However, there's overlap. Um, I myself have been working very much on the practitioner level for 20 years, but I'm also working in academia. I've also been involved in, in networks um, at a national and international level. And that's not uncommon within the Food Sovereignty Project. So you have these overlaps in which two or even sometimes all three of these different approaches um, come together. And I would suggest that it's in that, that middle section where all three come together that we really end up with the most kind of interesting and stimulating um, kinds of knowledge. Um, so, even though I have those rigid lines, they're not quite as rigid as, as they might have seemed at first. I would further go on to suggest that when it comes to the number of, of people and communities involved in this broad food sovereignty project, these are not proportionate, these are de demonstrative, but it's really the, the you know, thousands of communities and millions of people who are engaged in food sovereignty practice, whether they even use the term who are the largest group with kind of advocates, the people working on this kind of transnational and national networking and advocacy level, followed by academics who we tend to be a, a much smaller um, proportion of, of the people involved. However, when you really look at the discussion, especially the academic discussion of food sovereignty, mm -hmm. things shift. Things shift much more, I think, to something like this, where the practitioner voice is lost. Um, not only, and I'm not just talking about in the academic discourse, but even the particulars of, of in, so for example, Via Campesina, in advocating for the local, often by the very nature of it being a transnational movement, begins to lose the texture and the detail and that richness of local understandings very understandably in favor of a kind of broader agenda. So, you know, I think that this begins to prove to be a bit of a challenge for, for a movement that emerges largely and initially from um, practitioners. Um, that even within this kind of advocacy level, those local voices tend to be clouded and the detail and the richness of food sovereignty praxis and practice um, can begin to be watered down and lost. Um, within a lot of the academic literature, there seems to be a beginning recognition of some of this. People, you know, understanding that that, that localization discourse in this sense um, is, is being lost a bit in these larger conceptual 
understandings and conversations and debates around what food sovereignty is. And so there have been a number of calls for um, really examining, I mean, you know, you've got this one from Gupta who's talking about examining the importance of um, place-based approaches to really understand what does food sovereignty look like. It's one thing to assert these rights, to assert this vision, but you know, if I said, what is food sovereignty in Coventry? What would it really look like? And what are the steps it's going to take to get there? That we're often met with a real lack of understanding of, of those kinds of levels of detail. So I'm suggesting that we need to begin to really problematize and, and, uh, and address what's here called the complex, messy, real world examples of food sovereignty. But then even when there's that recognition, look what comes next. Consider the following hypothetical scenarios. We often will then move back on that because it's very difficult. And I'm going to talk about some of those difficulties and challenges of doing that, and also hopefully point a little bit of, of the way forward. Um, so in order to do that, I want to begin to address some of these, move it to a bit more specific. Uh, if we really want to understand food sovereignty and some of the critiques that are coming from practitioners, um, we need to begin to, to hone in. And so I'm going to talk a little bit specifically about some of the ways in which indigenous views of food sovereignty that are emerging from the practice and praxis at a, at a community-based level throughout North America is where I'm familiar with it, but I think globally, really begin to shift maybe some of how we think of food sovereignty. Um, so I'm going to just identify, and then on Thursday I'm going to talk about some of these in detail within a particular community, but these are some of the ways in which I would put forth that indigenous the visions of food sovereignty really differ from what's been happening at this kind of transnational level as well as within the academic debates. And first is when we go back to that first definition of food sovereignty, it's a rights-based um, discourse. You saw that word rights repeated over and over. Well, within most in indigenous communities with which I'm familiar, it's actually more about obligation that rights become something that's external. You assert rights ag against a, a government or against a corporation, but that the internal conversations are about right living, about the, the being in right relationship with other human beings, with the natural world, with the spiritual world. And so even that, that fundamental definition of food sovereignty, I think, is, is challenged by the experience of many indigenous communities for whom mutuality, social obligation, rather than rights-based um, conceptions are, are the foundation. Um, a second unique, well, not unique, but particularly important characteristic of indigenous views is the, the nature of being place-based. And that's kind of contested within this broader food sovereignty movement. And in Brazil, for example, you have landless workers movements who are very active in the food sovereignty um, advocacy level. And what they're, they're wanting is land. But it's not about particular land and particular place and particular relationships to place. Whereas indigenous communities, have these relationships with place that are fundamental to all aspects of life, from identity and culture to economics to ecological understandings to relationships with one another. So that place-based nature is not always, and it's increasingly being ref reflected in, in food sovereignty discourse, but it's not really always there. Um, thirdly, and I mentioned this already, relationship-based that in the kind of epistemologies of most indigenous communities, they're really fundamentally based on relationship, um, upon mutuality, social and mutual obligation, um, and that that happens over time and space and place, but 
that focus on the relationship between the human, the natural, and the spiritual worlds is quite critical. And that's, that relationship level is not always in this conversation. Um, fourth, culture. The centrality of culture and cultural identity that is in indigenous communities and indigenous conceptions of, of food sovereignty. Again, it's often viewed as a peripheral issue. Um, whereas for indigenous peoples, it's central. Um, there are really interesting alternative economic models that food sovereignty has been putting out there to challenge kind of neoliberalism within the, the global food system. However, they're often somewhat ideologically, um, and I don't, I don't want to say mainstream, but they're, they're tied to often Western ideologies of um, economics, whether they be Marxist, whether they be um, market driven, whereas there's really been very little exploration of what these economic models are that are much more indigenous, steady state kinds of economics. Um, and so I think there's a real challenge that's coming from indigenous communities there. And then finally, I think that it's really important, and this is a distinction that Don Morrison makes. Um, she's an indigenous writer from Canada. Uh, and in her case, she was talking about traditional ecological knowledge as opposed to food sovereignty, but I think it applies here, which is she said that traditional ecological knowledge in the Western sense is often a body of knowledge, and it's noun-based. It's a body of knowledge, it's information, it's nouns. Whereas in the indigenous conceptions, it's verb-based. It's not something you know, it's something you do. It's not something you have, it's something you live. And so I think that this, it's an important, more than just a linguistic turn, it's a really different turn in how we relate to the, the entire concept. Are we talking about what people do or are we talking about what they know? Are we talking about how people live or are we talking about a concept? So I think these are some of the ways in which kind of indigenous communities are really challenging this more, what I'd say is somewhat um, conventional approach to, to food <coughs> sovereignty right now. Um, so what I think is important is to really shift some of the dialogue, and it's not a rejection of advocacy, it's not a rejection of theory, but to say we really need to engage with that practitioner level, what food sovereignty looks like. And in order to do so, what I'm proposing is that we really need a broad set of long-term interactions in how food sovereignty is being both conceptualized and conceived of, as well as practiced and implemented in all of its complexity and all of its contested areas and its processes and its impacts and the challenges and in the stories. Um, that, and we need to do that in communities across the globe. Um, because I think it's critical that food sovereignty as a movement, food sovereignty as a project, really emerged out of that grassroots level of praxis and of practice. That our theory must be fundamentally connected to an understanding then of practice and praxis as well. Um, at the very least, it needs to be confirmed by really looking at what's happening in communities. It's not enough to develop kind of very theoretical understandings if they don't really reflect what's happening on that grassroots level. But even better, I would suggest, is that theory actually emerge out of those examinations um, and drive the theory. Um, and I think that part of what we have a responsibility to do, if food sovereignty is really to be this kind of emancipatory praxis within the food system and this move toward maximal democracy, um, is we have to be sure that the, the research that is done and the theorizing that is done actually has benefit to the, the practitioners on the grassroots level, the people who are doing this work. So I think we have an ethical obligation as people in kind of an institutional and research setting to ensure that the research that we do and the work that we do has those kinds of tangible benefits. And finally, I think that we need to ensure that the work that we're doing and that the research mirrors that fundamental concept of food sovereignty, which is, I would say, maximal democracy. And that means giving up control, giving up power to define, 
and democratizing that process of knowledge generation, of creating and defining um, how even the universe is conceived, which is a very difficult thing um, when we often work with communities. How do we really do that? I would suggest that it's only when we've done this, when we've had these kinds of engagements with and examinations at a very deep and profound level over time with people engaged in the, the day-to-day -day work of food sovereignty, it's only then that we can begin to really develop some comparisons, to really say, wow, you know, in, in Mali this was happening, and in Brazil that was happening, and in the Tomalton community this was happening, and there's a real commonality to that. And so rather than imposing um, theoretical conceptions on to practice, we need to begin to draw those out of what we're seeing on the grassroots level. I would suggest that there are um, that really affinities as a research approach uh, between participatory action research and food sovereignty um, that make participatory action research certainly one of the prime um, methodologies for understanding food sovereignty practice on that practitioner level. Um, they share some really fundamental goals and values. Um, Participatory action research, as well as the Food Sovereignty Project, are really viewed as an emancipatory praxis, a, a, a way of freeing and, and, uh, people, creating justice and equality um, within communities. So there's that affinity. There's a focus on the localization of production. And whether you're talking about localizing producing food or localizing producing knowledge, um, they both really share, share that localization of, of, kind of the means of production. Um, there's an elimination of, kind of these subject-object distinctions between those who um, study and those who are studied, those who act and those who um, theorize, that there's this breaking down of those kinds of distinctions. There's a process of collective learning and sharing of power, whether that's through participatory action research, where um, meaning and um, uh, kind of research is, is co-produced, um, or whether you're talking about campesino or campesino networks, farmer to farmer networks, all of these kinds of ways of um, exchange of, of information and knowledge within um, the food sovereignty project more generally. generally. And then as I mentioned, this kind of value on the maximal democracy. Um, so I suggest that, that food sovereignty, I'm sorry, that um, participatory action research um, can provide some really important methodological approaches to understanding the uh, food sovereignty at that practi practitioner level. Um, in addition to that, I think that indigenous research methods um, can provide some additional understandings um, that can drive our work. And the first of those is to really embrace different ontologies and epistemologies. It's not enough to bring in a structuralist model or a Western model of understanding the universe and try and apply that and, and put that into uh, work, whether it be in indigenous or non-indigenous communities. There needs to be an openness and not just a tolerance of, but a real embracing of these different ways of understanding the world. Um, indigenous communities really do often have not only fundamentally different ways of understanding, but even fundamentally different conceptions of, the, of reality. And so to begin to bring in the spiritual, to begin to bring in things like stories and legends and song are important ways of generating and creating knowledge and understanding within communities. Um, secondly, I think that indigenous approaches often describe things rather than define things. And I think that that's a part of kind of that verb and, and noun approach, um, where when you define things, it, it becomes more of a rigid set of categories. And despite I've been doing some of that here, you know, uh, that it's more important, and this is what I hope to do on Thursdays, describe, tell the story, share what's happening. Um, and out of that emerged the lessons. 
And it's not in our defining the lessons, it's in the very process of describing what's happening that those lessons emerge, which leads to this whole concept of storytelling. Um, uh, in the academic world, we're very, it's very common to do what I'm doing, make a set of arguments and draw a set of conclusions. Yet one of the primary ways of really sharing and generating knowledge in indigenous communities is the telling of stories. And those stories very rarely have neat conclusions. That in the process of storytelling, a storyteller may just tell the story and never draw a conclusion, never say, this is what this means. And what that does, it's a, a way of engaging people in that co-creation of knowledge. Recognizing ambiguity, recognizing the ways in, in which we might understand the universe in different ways and that the listener is invited into the process. So perhaps sometimes simply telling the story of a community or of an experience or of a time without then listing, and it means A, B, and C, and here are the conclusions. By doing that, you really are limiting A, the engagement of the reader and of the listener in that process. But you're also limiting and kind of cons um, cons containing the possible meanings that emerge. So I think it's really important to embrace some of those ways of, of understanding the world. And finally, positionality and relationship. I think that all work at the grassroots level, whether it's with indigenous or non-indigenous communities, must begin with building relationship often not over weeks and months, but over years and even decades, and being committed to those kinds of relationships in the long term. So finally, and I'm going to shut up in just a second and let you hear another, another community voice, I'm going to put out some principles that I would propose for moving ahead that come from the experience of, of myself and many other people in indigenous communities. Um, what research on food sovereignty at that practitioner level might do, and how we might want to move ahead. And the first is, I just mentioned it, relationships. Without building fundamental relationships of equality and trust, we cannot really realize the goals of either A, understanding food sovereignty, or B, really respecting the processes of indigenous and participatory methodologies. Um, and those relationships cannot be transactional. They have to be human. Um, if, if it's merely a transactional relationship, it's no longer a human relationship. It's almost an economic relationship. So all research, I think, has to start there. And that leads to this real of application of, of maximizing democracy within that research and that meaning-making process. And that means at the very beginning, building on the relationship, you can begin to establish goals and objectives and agendas and strategies for ways of understanding what's happening in communities. It's a very different approach than even within participatory methods, often researchers will come in and say, consider participation as, we've got this idea and this agenda or this research project and we would like you to participate. It's suggesting that participation has to be pushed back several levels to the level of defining what it is we want to do. We being a community, we not just being a researcher, we being a collective of people. Um, and then it must address the concerns, needs, and desires of those who are engaged in it. And it's only at that point that, that research really becomes um, part of that emancipatory process, whether it's understanding food sovereignty or moving in other directions. Fourth, I think it's essential that the primary benefits of research, not the exclusive benefits, but the primary benefits, really accrue to the, the people in the community. That we solve and are addressing the Real, wor real world needs of people and the questions that they have and the desires 
and needs that they, have, that they articulate and look at how research can further those rather than a kind of more abstract research agenda. And finally, we need to be open and embrace those multiple ways of conceiving of and understanding the world and ways of sharing knowledge. To recognize that sometimes we just leave the story alone. We don't need to interpret, but it stands as an invitation to others to engage with and interact with it. I've rambled on for quite a while, and I'm going to show a, a quick video, but I want to put it into context. Um, on Thursday, I'm going to talk about the work that we've done for coming up on 20 years within the Tonalpin community. Um, I was asked by Colin Anderson um, at a meeting we had last week whether the work that we've done over the last 20 years was conceived of as participatory action research. No. Did I conceive of my role as researcher? No. Did the community view what we were doing as research? No. However, it was research. If you think of research as the ability to define problems, seek answers, develop meaning and understanding, and create solutions, then that's nothing but what we've done for 20 years. And the ways that it's been done um, have been fundamentally respectful of, of some of these goals. So I'm not going to, you know, I've kind of talked for a long time. I don't want to go into exactly how we've done that. But I do think it's important to share um, one voice. This is a, a brief video. It's only about two minutes long. And it's um, an interview that was done with Terrell Johnson, with whom I helped start this organization 20 years ago. And this interview is almost 10 years old. But I hope that you're going to hear, not from my voice, but from a community member, some of these themes as, as they were really reflected um, and have been reflected in, in the work over the last 20 years. I think it's really important for the ideas and the actions to come from the community because it gives a sense of ownership, a sense of being in charge. We rely on the community. You know, they're the ones who tell us that they need this. They're the ones who tell us that you know, there's certain things that you need to focus on or do. So when you have a social gathering, you're bringing everybody from the community, not only your family, but the whole community. You know, and if you're working on a project, like say you're having a planting day and you need people to go out and help plant the seeds in the, in the ground, you know, you're building that, again, ownership and that sense of belonging that sense of pride. I think over the 10 years, we've proven to the community that you know we're, we're here and we can't go away because we're actually part of the community. You know, everybody that works at TOCA are, are from the community. You know, we're all them people working to, to keep our culture alive and people see that. How we got this land for our farm, our first farm was it came out of uh, trying to find a way how to um, pay respects and honor my grandfather because he was a farmer. And at that time, when Toka started um, working uh, to bring back a lot of the traditional foods, we, um, we thought about land and that meant us going to the family and getting the family's blessing. We sat the family down and we actually talked to them about them giving us this land, you know, to do our first farming for Toka. And we sat there and we actually gave the whole family our spiel about Toka and why, what the benefits were. And, you know, they, they liked it and they, they all agreed that my grandfather would have liked that. We actually had to bring my grandmother out to actually map out the area. We pretty much just spent the day out here following my grandmother. Once my grandmother would remember things, my aunts would jump in and say, yeah, and then stories started coming out. I had a camera, so it was really nice that I actually got it documented, but I didn't think at the time we all knew what we were getting ourselves into and how much of an impact it would have made on our family, but also on Atoka and the community. We always say at Atoka, you know, we look back to the past to create solutions for the future. That's what we're doing, and after 10 years, it's definitely working. Not all of the culture will get back, but you know, we keep going and learning as much as we can, and we're keeping it alive. And it's definitely helping us.
bring back the culture, bring back the ceremonies, the language, but also bring back our health. Yeah.